Today, I'm gonna to be going over my bachelor's in civil engineering degree from Cal Poly Pomona and my master's in structural engineering degree from UC San Diego. I'll be going over the classes I took, the ones that I failed, how useful were those classes in the real world, and why I decided to go to grad school. Hey, I'm Matt Picardle. I'm a licensed civil engineer in the Southern California area and I practice mainly on structural engineering for buildings. Let's jump into today's content. Let's start off with my bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Cal Poly Pomona. This university was particularly geared towards the philosophy of learn by doing. So a lot of the classes that we took, at least for civil engineering, included labs and professors that actually worked in the industry. So a lot of the stuff was hands-on practical stuff that I did end up doing in the real world. So that's what I really appreciated about Cal Poly Pomona. And as you'll see later on, the UC was very theoretical and less design work, but I thought that was also very important to get both the practical aspects and the theoretical aspects. You need both to be a good engineer. Here are my transcripts, some of the grades that I took. I'm gonna skip over the general education stuff and let's jump right into the, the good courses for civil engineering. The first civil related engineering classes that I took was a civil engineering CAD class. That was, I think I took two of those classes. That was very applicable at the time. A lot of firms were using CAD and we, it's still used today, but we use more of the advanced programs such as Revit that has more of the 3D stuff, but still very applicable. The next civil engineering class that I took was surveying. I wasn't really too interested in this class, but it was nice to know to finally figure out what those people on the roads were that had tripods or point stations. So when I started taking more math and physics classes, I wasn't too thrilled about those. I was kind of just going through the motions. Wasn't great at math, but I wasn't too bad either. And here's my first important class that I, if you're going into civil structural engineering, this is one of the most important classes that you'll be taking, vector statics. In the structural engineering field, you're most likely going to be dealing with this every single day. And yeah, you probably won't be doing all the crazy free body diagrams. It'll mostly be simple, but you're mainly using it at work to simplify concepts because you're working with advanced computer analysis a lot. There's a lot of times where you just need a simple free body diagram so you can sanity check yourself. So absolutely take this class seriously. Don't do what I did and kind of just cruise by. No one told me how important it was and I would have studied a lot more if I knew I was gonna be using it every day. Ah, oh, and here's the first class that I took. It was a math class. At this point in my civil engineering student career, I, was, I wasn't too motivated. I didn't know exactly what specialty I wanted to get into. I didn't take any of my core civil engineering classes. And I was just going through the motions of, oh, this class, why am I taking this class? When am I gonna use this? And I had bad study habits at that time too. What worked for me before was not working, especially as the math and subject matter got a lot more difficult. Vector dynamics is also an important class, something that you will be using, especially if you're working in areas that have a lot of earthquakes. The next important class is strength of materials, especially if, again, if you're going into structural engineering. You'll be using a lot of the concepts, a lot of the, the equations in the, on these in a daily basis, again, to simplify a lot of your computer calculations and verify them. So a very important class. Uh, and these next two classes, these were the last two classes that I failed. Because at this point I knew something was wrong. The study habits that I had weren't working. My learning style wasn't matching up with the teacher's learning style. And you know, at first I was being a little immature too. I was just blaming the teacher. These teachers weren't good or I wasn't, they, they basically weren't good teachers, I was telling myself. But you know, after I failed these classes, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if I have a bad teacher, I still have to pass the class. So this is when I really took a more focused approach on my study habits. I made a plan, I did things that I usually wouldn't do. I had to find ways to, to learn the material on my own, put in extra time on homework, I would basically go to a lot of study sessions. I'd get help from my classmates going to study sessions. If I had problems, I would also ask 
and go to the office hours, which I never used to go to. And the study groups really helped me a lot because I could ask others how they solved the problem and we could essentially learn from each other. I would solve it one way, I would get feedback and vice versa. I would go online for additional resources to learn that material. I'd go on blogs, I'd go on YouTube, and I even got books that were simplified versions or summaries of that subject that I was having trouble with because if I wasn't meshing with the teacher's teaching style, I had to find other ways to learn that material. A resource that I wish I had back then would be Brilliant, our sponsor for today's video. Brilliant has a lot of courses in math, science, physics, and even engineering. I like Brilliant because they make it easy to learn complex subjects. They have clear, easy to understand lessons and illustrations, as well as showing you how these lessons apply in the real world. I'm a very visual person, so I appreciated how the course on differential equations had interactive and clear visualizations, something that I wish I had when I was learning that subject. They even had lessons on how differential equations could be applied to structural engineering. I also enjoyed their scientific thinking course on structures where they present physics and trusses in a way that's practical. Because for me, I find it easier to learn subjects when I can actually see the real world practical applications of it. Go to brilliant.org slash Matt and sign up for free to check out their courses. The first 200 subscribers will also get 20% off the annual premium subscriptions. Thank you to Brilliant for providing this great discount and for sponsoring this video. After I made these changes and implemented these in my future classes, that's when my GPA started to go up. I wasn't always the smartest kid in class and I've always at least I thought I've always had to work harder and spend more time on concepts that I didn't learn because I wasn't always the fastest learner. But I knew if I just kept working at it and didn't give up and find different ways to, to learn that I'd get through it. So I got past those classes, then I started to get more into the civil, the core civil engineering courses. The first one was highway engineering. And this part was really cool because this, those core classes, that's when I got to see the practical aspects of civil engineering and what they actually do, what's their impact in the real world that affects the built environment. So seeing how highway engineering, transportation engineering, how these were practical and I was using them every day, I could see them every day in the real world. I think that's what really fires up my motivation for things. If I don't have a good reason on why I'm doing something, I'm not really too focused. The next cool class I took was engineering geology. I thought at first this was gonna be a really boring class. You know, you're gonna be learning about rocks, but the professor was so good that, you know, he got me excited to actually go out into the field and look at rocks. That's the class that almost got me to pursue a, a career in geotech. Almost. Took some engineering economics and a little bit of computational programming, basically Excel and MATLAB. Thermodynamics, which is useful for taking your FE licensing exam. Also took hydraulic engineering. Wasn't too interested in that, but it was still an interesting subject. But I knew I didn't want to pursue that as, you know, my, my specialized career. Oh, then I get into the tech communications. This is one of the best classes that I took at Cal Poly Pomona. This was a class that taught you how to be a professional and communicate professionally at work. We'd go over how to write and properly communicate effectively in the workplace, whether it's emails, memos, resumes, cover letters, and even public speaking. I can't tell you how much this gave me an edge when I started at the workplace because you're, you're using email every day and the way you communicate via email and via in person to other people that says a lot about you to your direct supervisors the public speaking aspect of it too was really scary for me at that point i wasn't used to public speaking and i was terrified and absolutely hated doing it at first every time before i would speak my heart would be beating my palms would be sweating. I'd always be, oh, I'd always be using a lot of filler words. And the first times for me going up there, I just felt terrified, scared, and did not feel like I was doing too well, especially going up in front of the class. But we kept doing it and I was still alive and just little by little, I'd keep getting just a little bit better. And that taught me that, hey, it's just a skill. It taught me that I can't just say I'm an introvert and therefore I can't public speak. No, it's just a skill just like anything else and everyone should be proficient at it at 
some decent level because one way or another, you're going to be speaking to a group of people, whether it's your team or a client or in front of your managers. So that was one of the best classes that I took. That was really practical. The next batch of classes, this is when we really get into the civil engineering that at least I really liked. So structural analysis, the geotechnical engineering, water supply was eh. Same thing with hydrology. Hydrology was cool, but really liked geotech and the structural analysis and design classes that I took. My advice, if you're an undergrad, try to take as many design, structural design classes as you can if you want to get into structural engineering. Here I took steel, timber, slope stability, retaining walls, and reinforced concrete. Oh, here's another good one. Role of design professionals in society. We actually had a lawyer and a professional engineer that was from the industry to teach us about contracts and proposals and law. Basically why you don't want to get sued as a civil engineering professional. The contracts aspect of it was also really cool, especially now that I'm getting more into the contracts and I can at least be familiar on how to read those contracts and what those contracts and proposals say at work. And around this time in my undergrad career, this was probably my last or second to last year when I started taking these classes. So for example, I had my senior project class, which was, a, I think about three quarters. And at that point I knew I wanted to pursue structural engineering. This was also the point where I started to get more involved in civil engineering extracurriculars. For example, I joined the Mechanically Stabilized Earth Wall or MSE team, part of CalGeo at the time. So I did research, I actually took that for some credits and I participated and was a team member on the competition. I was also a part of the EERI Seismic Design Competition and I was a CalGeo officer. Don't do what I did and join in your last couple years. I. For me, that was one of my regrets. I wish I would have joined earlier because I would have built my study groups faster. It was a lot easier to study with people that I knew and, were, and we were all taking the same classes, but it helps build your resume also, especially if you don't have prior internship or work experience. I had a hard time finding internships and by joining these clubs, organizations, and actually putting in time and effort into those roles, it helped me get my foot in the door for those interviews and my first internships. Going back to my senior project, that was a really practical senior project as well. It was a actual building that was previously built and our professor basically gave us the architectural drawings and had us design it. And in the real world, that's pretty much what you're gonna be doing. You'll work with the architect and you'll be designing the building. I knew I wanted to do structural engineering at that point and that project even cemented it even more that I wanted to go to grad school. Right before I graduated, that's the, when I decided that I wanted to go to grad school, which was a little too late. So I had to wait a year to actually go to grad school. During that year, I got my first two internships for working for the city and working for a structural engineering firm. So that year was not wasted for sure. So I applied to a bunch of grad schools, got accepted by some, got rejected by probably more, but I was fortunate enough to be accepted into UC San Diego. I was pretty surprised because the average GPA for you know the incoming grad students was about 3.8 and I was only a, at about a 3.3 or 3.4. So very grateful that I got to attend that university. Why did I go to grad school? First of all, I was really interested in the subject, especially earthquake engineering and designing buildings. And second of all, talking to industry professionals and my professors, that at least in earthquake prone countries, or at least in the US at least, in California, where I wanted to work, it was almost a requirement to get an entry level position as a st structural project engineer. Now that I've been in the industry for a couple years and kind of see more of the bigger picture. The main reasoning for going to grad school for structural engineering is to learn the why of the seismic force resisting systems of the building. Basically, the members in a building that resist the earthquakes. Undergrad, you're mostly learning just about gravity. You're learning the why on why concrete beams, concrete slabs, steel beams, steel columns. You learn how the gravity design of those things work. You just don't have enough time to learn all the seismic stuff. 
and that's where grad school comes in. All right, first quarter at UC San Diego. A lot of math classes, intro to applied math, advanced structural analysis, and solid mechanics. I struggled with these. This was when I went from a practical program at Cal Poly Pomona and then switching for the first time to a UC system, I saw the difference. Very theoretical, at least from my perspective, going to UC San Diego. This first quarter, no design, all math, all math that I wasn't good at. A lot of MATLAB, a lot of matrices, a lot of differential equations, things that I really had to freshen up on during that time. And I felt behind, there was a lot of imposter syndrome going on with me in that quarter. You know, a lot of my classmates went from very reputable schools, and yes, I was struggling, but you know, I went back to the, my solid study habits and put those on overdrive. Definitely put in the extra time, put in the extra work, ask for help, learn the materials from different angles and different resources, and it clicked. And these classes were important because I was basically gonna use all those mathematics and even the programs like MATLAB throughout my graduate degree. For the second quarter, I felt I was adjusted to all the math and kind of what the teaching system was. So at that point, I was just learning and taking everything like a sponge. Nonlinear analysis was really cool. That's when we first started to get into earthquake engineering and how buildings behave during earthquakes. It wasn't elastic or linear elastic analysis where you could pretty much do your calculations by hand. They were easy enough to do. With nonlinear, this is why we needed all that math. With nonlinear, yes, you can do it by hand, but it's not practical. So when, when you can take advantage of software such as MATLAB, then we're, in that class we used a, a nonlinear analysis program, OpenSeas, which wasn't user-friendly, but very powerful. Taking advantage of software, that's when the, the cool stuff came in. So at that point, you could basically model a building and see how it would behave during an earthquake. For the third quarter, that was probably my favorite quarter with these classes, advanced structural steel design. I had Professor Wong, and he did an awesome job of mixing the practical aspects of it with his research, uh, with design work, and the theory on why the steel building codes are the way they are. So that was one of my favorite classes. Earthquake engineering, that was a really practical class too. I think we got into the aspects of of how the earthquake codes and, and the building codes were, were derived and what the purpose of those were. And advanced seismic design of structures, that was basically a performance-based design class where we got to put everything together. We would get earthquake engineering to see how earthquakes behaved, and we would get the nonlinear analysis that we, we've learned already, apply those two, then you can get your performance-based or your advanced analysis and apply it to buildings. After that, I got my summer internship at a structural engineering firm and then went back to finish off my last quarter, my fall quarter. That's where I took a bridge design class, which was also very practical from a practicing engineer. That was probably the most practical class that I've taken uh, at, at UCSD at least. And I also took some base isolation and finite element analysis classes. So how practical was grad school now that I've been working in the industry? If we're talking about on a daily basis, no, I don't use it every day at my work directly. Mainly because a lot of the buildings that I work on don't require performance-based designs. Performance-based design is pretty much a special request or a special building, such as if you have a high rise or you have a, a building that needs really special seismic requirements, such as a hospital but you may end up at a firm or at a role where you are the performance-based design specialist. In my firm, I'm not that guy, but we definitely have people that are experts in that. For me, it was still worth it to go to grad school. I got to know the why, the ins and outs, the code intent of all these seismic provisions and code standards. As an engineer, that's important because you're basically the doctor for the building. Contractors may ask, hey, can we remove this beam here? No, you need it for X, Y, Z. So very important to know the why and 
the intent because the code's not gonna tell you everything. Sometimes you'll need to make engineering judgments on your own. So that's why I found it very useful. And as a reminder, if you want to give Brilliant a try, I left all the details in the description below. Thanks for watching. I hope you have a great day, a great career, and a great life. I'll see you next time.